Wonderful. Thank you so much. Great to be here with you all um, in this session of Capturing Carbon Neutral or Negative by 2050. Um, thank you so much for joining us at, at this session. Uh, we'd, we'd like to almost rename this uh, Capturing Carbon, but maybe decarbonization more generally. I'm Cynthia Figge, CEO and co-founder of CSR Hub. We're a global database of ESG ratings on over 50,000 companies worldwide. And welcome to this session, uh, Grant and Andrew. Very happy to have you both here. Um, in 2008, I moderated a session with Dr. James McCarthy, co-chair of the IPCC 3 at Future and Review Conference two, and 14 years ago. Uh, just recently, the IPCC uh, released their sixth assessment report, one of the hardest hitting, um, drawing on 34,000 studies, 270 authors, and seven years of work. And um, I, think, I think it's one of the clearest calls to uh, the importance of what we're doing and what we're focused on today uh, with, with uh, already uh, an increase in 1.1 degrees Celsius of warming, half of the globe uh, faces water insecurity um, at least uh, one month per year. And wildfires are scorching larger areas than ever. Um, leading to irreversible changes to the landscape. There is, of course, as we all know at FIRE, just massive interdependence on all these different issues. And it's always nice to go later in the conference and have the benefit of a lot of wisdom that has preceded us. But Grant, um, I think the report would say that the, the window is closing. I'd love to have you introduce yourself. Uh, let us know what brought you to this work combating climate change. And um, please give us an overview of your company, Drone Seed. Yeah, happy to. Um, so uh, Grant Canary, CEO of Drone Seed and uh, president of uh, Silver Seed. Um, my background is everything I've ever done has been in sustainability. Um, so working uh, for US Green Building Council before it became the, the juggernaut that it is today. Uh, Vestas Wind Energy sent me around the world uh, to China, Denmark, and the U.S. installing wind turbines. Um, I have the esteemed pleasure of having founded a company uh, that raised maggots, um, fed food waste, um, basically uh, utilized them as, a, as an industrial source of protein, alleviate pressure on fish populations, uh, specifically fish meal uh, species, and then utilize food waste. Um, that company got acquired uh, built a pilot facility, built a 60,000 square foot maggot cultivation factory, and now it's going on to 200,000 today. Um, leaving that, I wanted to make a much bigger dent in carbon emissions. Um, so Drone Seed, um, what we do is uh, we are two companies. We just acquired Silva Seed in April 2021. Drone Seed is a five-year-old tech company, and Silva Seed is a 130-year-old company. Um, we are vertically integrated reforestation. Um, and what that means is... Um, we, if we drone seed focuses almost exclusively on uh, post wildfire. So a land manager, whether they're the nature conservancy, a timber company, a tribal nation or state or federal agency or a small family forest. First step in the process is they're gonna need seed. That's very scarce and we can talk about why. Um, they're gonna need seedlings grown in greenhouses. There's not enough greenhouse uh, grow space. And, um, and then they're gonna need uh, folks to do the reforestation. So um, the first two silver seed takes care of, the second two drone seed takes care of, which is we provide better tools for labor. And then they're gonna have to pay for it all. With, and that's where the carbon offsets come in. And so my two goals here today are to make sure everyone leaves with more information about uh, offsets and how they're nuanced because we're pioneering in that space um, with many, many esteemed partners and um, that forests aren't regrowing historically um, the same way they did after wildfire and that wildfire is exponentially increasing. If you're aware of that part, but I think that there's less knowledge around the like, we can't just go to the tree store and get more trees. There is some significant supply chain issues that have nothing to do with COVID uh, or uh, Ukraine. And so um, we wanna, wanna highlight on both of those aspects. So yeah, so that's uh, that's a little about me and uh, Jonesy. Thanks, Grant. Um, and I want to encourage everyone to go to uh, Drone Seed's website and look at the videos because uh, I think that once you see 
kind of see the the drones in action it's um seeing is believing it's just it's really incredible um and as somebody who worked for for warehouser for a number of years this is, is incredible work um so andrew we've known one another since 1993 and your very good work at microsoft um i listened to your recent tedx talk and you said uh, I hope I got the quote right. Solving climate change requires large scale, systemic, structural revolution in human relations, human culture, and in materials. And at the very center of that revolution are buildings. Please tell us um, a little bit about your background, how you came to work at the Carbon Leadership Forum, and what this organization is doing to combat climate change. And you're still muted, Andrew. There we go. You might there regret go. you might regret your decision to let me have a mic. <laughs> oh. We we can cut you off. <laughs> All right, good. So, um, well, to as, to answer your your last question first, actually, I think I was originally inspired to do the work that I'm doing today by uh, the theme of fire. I think it was five or six years ago. Mark could probably tell me uh, really easily. But um, six years ago, the uh, fire conference focused on a potential solution to climate change that, they, that the folks there identified as the carbon trifecta, which essentially meant pull carbon out of the excess carbon out of the atmosphere, put it into the materials, uh, transform it into materials that could be put into products that could be sold profitably into markets, uh, using new technologies such as 3D printing and so on. And I, I think uh, it's, you know, it it's clear a few years on that that fundamental strategic framework was useful and important. And things have played out a little slightly differently over the last few years than uh, people could have predicted, I think, easily five years ago. But that's essentially what we're doing today. So I want to put this in a in a framework. The challenge is that by 2060, we'll have over 10 billion people on the planet. And as global population rises, urban areas around the world are booming. That means more and more buildings are going up. By one estimate, the world will be adding another 2 trillion square feet of new buildings by 2060. And that's the equivalent of putting up another New York City every 35 days for 40 years. Well, when we think about or talk about carbon emissions, we're usually thinking about some big categories that cut across everything else, transportation, manufacturing, energy. When we talk about buildings, we're usually thinking about how much energy they use, like for lighting or heat, but not what they're made of. But those other big categories are also about creating buildings, about manufacturing materials, transporting them, putting them together into the shape of buildings. And the materials that we make buildings out of today have a massive carbon footprint. Individually, global cement and, and steel production each contribute more emissions annually than all of the energy used for all commercial buildings in the entire world. And together, they represent about 15% of global emissions. And that means that just two kinds of materials generate more emissions in the agricultural sector, just a little bit less than global transportation, which is also about 15%. So this is surprising for most people because we don't hear about, about these emissions set, cut out of, of the pie. Uh, they're often hidden inside global supply chains. While it might be easier to see and understand gas-fired cars, coal-fired power plants that are on the front page of your newspaper, so the, the question then is, how can we solve this problem? And just very briefly, some bullet points. To start with, we can reduce emissions most dramatically by retrofitting buildings rather than tearing them down. Uh, whenever possible, don't just build a new building, retrofit and make better an existing building and reuse building materials when we have to tear something down. Secondly, architects, engineers, developers, building owners, can design and construct buildings to be smarter, lighter, use less materials, and use materials with a lower carbon footprint. They can use new databases, part of, uh, part of the mission of the organization I work with for, 
is about building databases and tools that allow architects, engineers, developers, and so on to use databases, tools, and technologies that help them to understand and then to calculate, compare, and reduce the carbon, carbon footprint of new buildings. Manufacturers of materials can, can publish environmental product declarations. These are scientifically valid, third-party verified disclosures of the carbon footprint of the materials that they sell. It's, it's similar to the nu nutrition label on the side of a box of Cheerios. And finally, policymakers, decision makers at all levels of government and business can require and inspire and incentivize reporting, transparency, and then action to reduce the carbon footprint of materials. There really are um, three essential things that we need to think about here. First of all, is don't tear it down if you can, um, if you can possibly help it, make it better. Secondly, transform the way we make existing building materials. And thirdly, let's, uh, let's use uh, innovative solutions, innovative technologies, innovative um, even biogenic building materials that can actually on balance store more carbon for the life of a building than it takes to build and operate uh, the building. Thanks, so I'll, just, I'll pause there for, for just, just a bit. Great. You'll take all my questions. Um, I, I, Grant, one of the things I think is really interesting that I'd like to hear from, from you is it, it kind of the, it maybe address a, the same uh, challenge, but from, the, uh, from a very different perspective of you're really focused on this uh, regeneration and, and, and forest and land, um, what is the, what are we talking about here? What is the scale? What, what uh, when we think about this, I think we all think about the Amazon, but I think that uh, if you can kind of describe what's going on in the United States and then maybe give us a feeling for what's happening globally. Um, and, and then uh, what, what might be different in terms of the technology that you're introducing, what, what is, how does that going to change things or speed things up? So it's kind of address the scale issue and then tell us a little bit about, um, you know, why for, you know, we all think forests kind of magically come back. That's not going to happen. What's, what is, what has changed? Yeah. I mean, happy to. Um, so, I mean, I think the, the easiest way to conceptualize it is that like FAO data, food and agriculture organization, UN, um, we plant a, a, a lot of trees, um, about 8 million globally uh, a year. Um, and uh, sorry, 8 million uh, acres worth. So, um, and then if we look at what we are losing in the US alone to wildfire, it's about 7 million plus. So comparison, 8 million acres uh, globally to just losing uh, the um, 7 million acres in the US um, as far as what's planted versus what's lost. So. You compare those two numbers and you're like, okay, well, that's that's a problem. Um, and then you factor in climate change. Well, the 10 year rolling average for climate change for uh, for the US as far as like what we're losing in wildfires was around two to three million acres a year. Um, now around seven million acres, I mean, just for comparison, that's you know, five in the state of New Jersey, over five million acres. So we're losing about a New Jersey or another way to conceptualize it, about five warehousers worth of reforestation a year. So that's a lot of numbers to sort of give some conceptual like wrapping arms around the size of the problem. Um, and I think like really what we what we look at as far as like why why focus on that or why is that occurring? Why, why can't we, what's happening? Well, climate change is the obvious, the size and severity of the wildfires. Um, trees aren't naturally growing because the high intensity fires as opposed to low severity fires, low severity fires, uh, we see, we see nine times out of 10 forest burns, forest regrows with higher severity fires. What happens is that the cones for temperate conifers, um, that are in the tops of the trees or in buried in the soil, those get burned as part of the fire. Whereas low severity fires goes through, it's kind of like a creme brulee. The seeds are all still happy down at the bottom of the soil. And so when we look at that, what's happening is now, instead of it being nine times out of 10 forest burns, forest regrows, we're looking at it as depending on the ecosystem, depending on the, the tree species, and it takes time to acquire the data, but six times out of 10, four times out of 10, 
And so you, you look at the, the 10 year rolling average going up 5 million acres a year. Um, and you look at what's happening as far as uh, regrowth. Um, sorry, I should restate that. So gone up from 2 million to 7 million acres a year. Um, and you look at it and you say, okay, well, trees are, are the, they were seeing a fall off in what naturally regrows. That's a, it's a significant problem. And then we're, how can we step in? Well, we don't have sufficient supply of seed. The, the industry has been built with orchards where it ha- we've, well, through old school breeding, um, we have uh, basically bread trees to, have, to grow straight, to go tall, to grow fast. And um, that's great for building a really sustainable um, building material and growing that. However, um, what comes out of that is it, it takes 20, 40 years to spin up new orchards for temperate conifers. And so uh, that hasn't been accounted for as we head into uh, an extra 5 million acres of reforestation to do a year. That is a lot. Um, so that's kind of where we see some of the, the big challenges there. And then if you have the seed, you need the grow space. And so there's some white papers that have been produced and I'm happy to throw those into the chat, but we need, a, we, we need a 6X increase in the amount of seed collected. We need a 2X increase in the amount of grow space or just nursery space. Um, it takes you know industry standard year to two years to grow seedlings and we don't have enough space. Uh, we're not aware of nurseries outside of their regular book of business that if the you know, land manager has a fire that are taking any new orders until 2024, which means delivery in 2025, 2026. And so all of a sudden, well, that's a huge issue uh, because that just creates what American Forest is calling reforestation debt. And uh, you all of a sudden you have a really big fire year like 2018, another big one in 2020, another big one in 2021. It used to be that the industry would have, you know, 50,000 acre fire was a career fire um, and you'd only see it once in your career. Now it's 250 to 500,000 acres regularly. And it used to be that you'd have 10 years to recover and the nursery could, could this nursery space could absorb that grow need over time. Well, now it's every year, every other year. And so all of a sudden you see a very, very big backlog or traffic jam of need for seedlings. So um, that's, you know, that's the purpose for us behind the acquisition of Silva Seed. We've expanded to become the largest private seed bank um, west of Colorado. Wow. Um, and then we're growing mm-hmm. millions of seedlings per year. So that's, that's kind of where we focus. And that's some of the like, no why behind why aren't, why aren't we just seeing sort of forest burns, forest regrows as we rebuild the supply chain that then takes us into great, let's plant not only what we've lost each year, but more and get into afforestation of like, let's plant more than what we've lost each year. Yeah. Wow. Um, Andrew, you know, I think uh, as I listen to, to both of you, uh, funding and who pays becomes a, a really compelling question. Uh, I, I think that um, I'm really interested in hearing, and I, and I do think, you know, going back to you, Andrew, on, on, the, on the scale of this and also the percentage of, you know, sort of carbon um, and what we have to address, I think, is, off, is, is often underestimated. It, it certainly is, gets less play through, I think, um, than, say, transportation. And maybe that's because, you know, all of us are making decisions around with cars and maybe feel a little bit less in control of the buildings um, and, our, and our ability to make choices. But in, in terms of, of the work that you're seeing and, and the scale that uh, we need to, to uh, change, um, where do you see the sources of funding coming from? And you know, who's going to pay for the advancements in building solutions from your perspective? To answer that question, it would probably be helpful for me to kind of define our topic a little bit more uh, directly and then talk about who, who has a motive to support solving this problem and therefore, and that kind of helps to, dis, to explain where the money comes from, I think. So I'm gonna, let right. me share my screen uh, quickly for just a moment and let you see uh, kind of a, what the definition for embodied carbon is. It's a term that most folks haven't heard about. As a matter of fact, in the building industry, this notion of embodied carbon was not part of anybody's conversation three to five years ago at all. 
most people in the building industry had never heard of embodied carbon. So basically, embodied carbon is, it's a bookkeeping term. It essentially says um, for building materials, in order to understand their impact, you or for the carbon footprint of any building, you can't just think about the energy that they use uh, to operate. You have to think about everything that they're made of and the carbon footprint of each of the materials that go into the building. And so we sometimes uh, call embodied carbon upfront carbon because in 2022, for any new major building project going up today, approximately 50% of the lifetime carbon emissions connected with that building's op construction and operation are emitted before day one, before anybody ever begins to use the building. That's really significant. Uh, for, in other words, embodied carbon is equivalent to operational carbon or energy. Over the next 80 years, embodied carbon. And that means that um, if you actually want to do something to keep the, the planet under 1.5 degrees centigrade temperature rise globally, you have to address embodied carbon immediately. And that's why uh, today, actually, um, things have radically changed in the last two to three years. Embodied carbon is the number one topic of conversation across the industry. And it's, it's partly because people care about the climate, but I would argue it's even more true because people understand that there are existential business risks by not addressing it. Not, not just to the entire industry, but to individual companies. If you have the reputation of not doing anything, not having any solutions related to embodied carbon or, or the decarbonization of building materials, it means you will be losing business in a major way, especially as major companies in the, tech, in the technology industry, our partners include companies like Amazon and Microsoft and Google and Salesforce, every major technology company is a part of our network and is helping to support the Carbon Leadership Forum or uh, helping us to develop tools and reports related to, to understanding the, the challenge and then figuring out solutions. So um, mm -hmm. the answer then, um, let me just uh, kind of go, go ahead to this slide here. Our theory of change is in order to address this problem, you need three components, fundamental strategic components. You have to build a broad scale, a broad scale, a large scale collective impact initiative that includes all of the companies, all of the organizations across the building industry and invites them to share ideas, share language, share targets, share baselines, and, and then to share resources and tools and data as well. So uh, sharing and doing things together is how we get to transformative change. Secondly, we have to dramatically improve data and methods uh, to understand what the challenge is and then specific solutions to it, the impact that they'll have. And finally, policy needs to drive change, needs to drive the transformation of markets. Markets by themselves won't do it. We need help from policymakers at all levels of government and business. Um, so when it comes to companies, uh, we're inviting, and, and it, it turns out that many, many global uh, companies are now pivoting to develop their own decarbonization plans. They do it internally, they do it, they, um, they publish the results or the plans publicly, and they share their learning around it. Um, so our, our mission involves all three of these things, collective impact, improving data and methods based on, on solid research, and then informing policy debates and discussions and decisions um, at all levels. Within the last year, we have been in conversation with and have helped to develop uh, new policies that drive down carbon emissions from building materials with nine of the 50 states. That number is increasing on, on, uh, on, a, on a very regular basis. We've been in, um, in deep discussions with the Biden administration, with the EPA, and with the White House uh, to, to drive uh, policy changes that can dramatically in, uh, reduce the uh, decarbonize or increase the degree to which procure, federal procurement for infrastructure spending, for example, 
is dramatically um, is dramatically enhanced, and um, mm -hmm. and we're in in uh, in collaboration with global organizations, including the UN's Global Alliance for Building and Construction, the World Resources Institute, the uh, World Business uh, Council for Sustainable Development, and so on. Right. Well, thanks, thanks, Andrew. I mean, I, just to pick up on that point, I've been tracking for years um, uh, how companies are committed or committing to net zero, you know, making kind of formal commitments that they'll be net zero by 2050. Some committing to science-based targets, very few, real, relatively speaking. Google has announced that they've eliminated their entire carbon legacy, covering all operational emissions before they became carbon neutral in 2007, through the purchase of high quality carbon offsets. So they claim that their lifetime net carbon footprint is now zero. Grant, um, I think there's you know, just a lot of skepticism around offsets. And letting you know the perception that companies and countries are off the hook. Um, what role? I mean, and we've talked about this that there is a much more nuanced understanding of offsets. What role do carbon offsets play in decarbonization and and net zero? And what role are they playing um, in drone seeds uh, business model? Yeah, love it. And this is one of my, my goals is that everyone comes away with a better understanding here. So um, pumped for that question. I mean, this is why I love trees, which is that people get trees. Um, they remove carbon out, out of the atmosphere. They're high quality, they're scalable. But aside from where sort of our technology uh, around growing trees sits, like a thought experiment, if humans were gone tomorrow, we would still pump so much carbon into the atmosphere that we would go, the, the Earth's ecosystem would go through climate change regardless. Um, and so uh, today we absolutely need to remove carbon out of the atmosphere um, and trees that are scalable today and high quality and people get them. And in fact, they're, they're, they're hardwired to understand and love trees. Um, so I think on that side of things, like, you know, that's, that's what I'll start with offsets is like removing carbon from the atmosphere, absolutely needed. On the second side of things, it's like, well, how, how, what's the, what is the scene of offsets? And they're like, there seems to be like a binary of like, oh, they're good. Or they're like, no, they're evil. And I feel like there's a lot more nuance there of like, well, that's like, we can compare it to currency or the dollar. You could say, yes, it facilitates criminal activities. Yeah, but it's also how we do humanitarian aid. It's more of a system than it is a, a good or a bad. Um, and it's how it's utilized. And so offsets are no different um, in the sense that they, you know, coming from a place of like a significant intellectual honesty, like companies absolutely should be doing the things to decarbonize, to electrify. Um, if you if you know, if you have deliveries in your in your business model, like yes, it should be going to electric vehicles, you should be getting, you know, Rivians or your choice of electric vehicles to make those deliveries. But if we follow an 80-20 rule, like not all the technologies have gone through their growth curve to get us there. So uh, say, say 80% can be removed out, but there's 20% that right now, um, you know, we, we consider aviation. I'm all about electric aviation, blimps, other methods to transport people through the air. However, it's going to be a while before electric aviation goes through its growth curve. And if it takes, um, you know, we can, we can pump it up as much as we want uh, with capital and investment and otherwise, but it's still going to take some amount of time. And that's really where we want to utilize offsets that and we need to do removals. So it's very much a yes and situation of um, mm -hmm. remove, remove carbon out of the atmosphere because we just need it um, as of today. And then also utilize it for that for that percent that's going to be very sticky in the business model that's going to be hard to get rid of while also coming at it from a place of like yes please decarbonize um and uh electrify everything where, where i'd love to take this right. is to uh what are you know how how can people trust if it's a, if we view offsets as a as a currency currency is only valuable to the extent that people trust it and so um, that's where, you know, from, from my background with U.S. Green Building Council um, and uh, sort of the, 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 you know, to kind of riff off of um, what we've got, uh, the conversation going with Andrew here is that like the, there's a third party group that we work with that creates the protocols that actually generate the offsets. 
And so for our business model, if you've got that 20% that's in electric aviation or, or, or it's in aviation and it's not yet gone electric, um, it's really like what we do is we speak to two things, additionality and permanence. And so the additionality here comes in if we're post wildfire, there need, there's, there's historically been a lack of capital available for reforestation. Most offsets have uh, put easements on existing stands of trees, which is good. It protects those trees. Um, however, it doesn't fund reforestation. And so there's not been that funding source. And due to an abundance of caution around greenwashing, the most of the protocols until 24 months ago only contemplated uh, this method. Uh, and so if you wanted to do fund reforestation, you had to wait for temperate conifers 20, 40 years to get your money out. And so there wasn't that sustainable source of like, how do we do more reforestation? Um, the mm. third party group that we work with is Climate Action Reserve. They've created a protocol. And so what they do is they take the same math that we would utilize for uh, timber. How many two by fours am I gonna get out of this acreage with Doug fir in Western Washington or Oregon? And um, then they can forecast forward, um, here's how much uh, you know, switch out two by fours for tons of carbon. Here, I mean, it's how much tons of carbon will be removed. Make it very conservative. Uh, create an insurance buffer pool so that if there's a reversal, aka wildfire, or otherwise, all of the projects have put you know approximately 10% of their offsets into that pool, and those those credits can be retired. And then there's an easement placed on the land um, that's held. That's a legal lien on the property. And it's held by a, a state accredited land trust with an endowment of, that is paid as part of our projects um, that just like any university with an endowment pays for the continuation of people coming out to um, visit the site uh, every five years and write a written report every single every year. And so that's where we get some of that um, transparency and trust put into the offset as a currency. And that's new, we'll be one of the first five projects uh, out the gate um, on that and issuing those offsets and very excited about where the offset market's headed. We can talk more about that, but the market size, both compliance and voluntary has jumped tremendously from a $270 billion industry in 2020 to 800 plus that's Refinitiv's analysis. And um, so there, there's people going in this direction and we can talk about why. Wow. Thank you. Um, and what's the, actually just on that note, what's the, what's, what is your Refinitiv's um, prediction of how, of how big that'll look even just in the next two years? Do you, do you know? Well, the, I mean, the market size is, is a function of the price and the price has gone up yeah. pretty significantly. And so Bloomberg, New Energy Finance, I mean, they had three scenarios, one of which was the price goes up 50x. Well, that's, that's actually, you know, wow. in some ways it's like, oh, great, we should see the price of carbon go up, it just costs a lot of money to pollute. But in some ways that becomes problematic because it can actually cool investment if it goes up, you know, right now, uh, anywhere from uh, 20 to $50 a ton. Well, if it goes up to $450 a ton, all of a sudden, you know, in Seattle, where we're based, Climate Pledge Arena, um, you know, named by Amazon, becomes a very expensive arena. Um, at $450 a ton, and that can cool some investment. So really what we would wanna see is, you know, what's driving that is there's a lack of supply of high quality removal offsets. And so what, you know, what this system does is it by forecasting forward on a very conservative basis, what will be removed over the next uh, 100 years, you could do it for shorter, but the easement um, on the West Coast, Oregon, Washington, 100 years, um, that allows us to put more supply of offsets into the market. And it also does it so that as the trees grow, they're really doing a lot of their work um, over the next 10 years, uh, 20 years. And so like right when we're, we, we're absolutely needing the most amount of removal, which you know, it should, yesterday, um, they're coming online. Mm -hmm. So it's funding that upfront in a really big way. So that's exciting. And it also provides enough offsets in the system. That, yeah, the price will go up, but it will, it will remain something that doesn't immediately uh, break balance sheets, uh, which is important. Right, thank you. Um, Andrew, I, I think one of the, the things that I've been uh, wondering about uh, for maybe just uh, us as, as citizens and as, as people who occupy buildings, but you know, most of us aren't building, building them. Um, you know, what is, 
uh, you know, what is our role in this in this whole system? Um, do we have do we have much of a role as individuals, or is this is, is this kind of systemic uh, challenge really going to be played out um, more by my you know corporations um, and 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 gov uh, you know and policymakers? Well, I've got a really great story to tell. <laughs> response to that question so you know if in some ways this feels like oh my god it's so this problem is so big and the solution is so massive what could i possibly do to help out anything here and so um i want to tell you about about uh i think it was about six months ago i got a a, a um a contact from a girl scout troop leader in madison wisconsin a, a woman named julia pooler and she said, so I lead a troop of Girl Scouts ages eight to 11. And we decided that we wanted to make a great big contribution to addressing climate change. And we did a bunch of research, me and the girls, and we decided that we learned from the Carbon Leadership Forum that, that one of the most significant, hugest contributors to climate change was carbon emissions from the making of cement. And so we decided to create an educational video to, to, to teach all of the policymakers in the state of, of Wisconsin about the importance of decarbonizing the process of manufacturing cement. And they did that. They developed the, uh, through, through some advice and co consultation and, and collaboration with the Carbon Leadership Forum, they developed that video. It's amazing. And these, these girls are just incredibly smart and really eloquent. And they created a, an extraordinary video. I'll put the link in the chat window when I stop talking here. And um, about, about uh, three weeks ago, um, I hosted a, a meeting that they organized. I just set up the Zoom chat, the Zoom window. That's all I did. And these, yeah. and, and even Julia, their scout leader, uh, didn't have a, a single word to say during the event. The, about uh, 11 of these girls hosted the event. They, um, they had 90 some policymakers from Madison, from the city of Madison, from Dane County, from several other, other counties, from several state agencies, a good number of state legislatures, uh, uh, leg legislators for, from Wisconsin, and then a bunch of people from the cement and concrete industries. And they went deeply into it and they asked really tough, challenging questions of all of these people with some real significant power. I, I guess the point that I'm making is we can't make this change just by a few experts getting in, in a room or a few scientists doing some research or a few people uh, deciding that they ought to do something. It has to be a million people all taking action on this together. Yeah, I love that. Um, I don't know if, if, if um, everyone got a chance to see um, the discussion with Heidi Larson, but I was I was so moved by um, her um, her her theme, which is confidence, uh, which is is built on trust and trust coming, and and she said she was going to sort of pivot from vac vaccines to climate change because the scale of the problems that we face is going to require such dramatic um, trust uh, and understanding across our system. And so that's, um, that's the best story I've heard yet, uh, Andrew. Um, Grant, I'm, uh, you know, I think for some of us, you know, we go to conferences, we go to, or we'd love to go to a conference and it's great to see y'all on Zoom, but I can't wait to, to fire in person. Um, sometimes, you know, we get on airplanes and we kind of feel a little bit better about it because we may do the offsets, but kind of same, similar question for you, uh, which is, um, as this plays out in the, in the work that you're doing, uh, it, is there a role for, for us as individuals or as, you know, consumers or as, uh, citizens? 
there's there, there's absolutely a, a, a role. Um, we have similarly encountered the same um, with our lemonade stands for trees and cocoa for trees, and there's some uh, delightful videos there. Um, uh, the the role that I would you know, and we we direct those to One Tree Planted um, as far as uh, it's to, to receive those donations, but very much they're inspired by Mark Rober's video on drone seed that we did as a part of um, mm -hmm. One Trillion Trees campaign. Um, or sorry, 20 million trees for uh, with which is a YouTube collaboration. Um, I, yeah. You know, I'm here. I'll represent a slightly different perspective here um, because, and I think, I mean, uh, hopefully that's that's appreciated. Then, um, it, you know, the collective action method. I would love. The, there's absolutely a place for it, and the biggest impact people can make is on policy and voting, um, and who they vote for and how they vote for. Um, the uh, the FERC and the um, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, um, how that, you know, that is the biggest way that people can impact and it's already available to everyone today. On the, on the, on the other side though, like, you know, there was a question in the chat, which was how much of the offsets are purchased by individuals and how much are purchased by, by corporations. A lot of, you know, the vast, vast majority is by corporations. So what I'm kind of working around here too, as a very different perspective is, is the the financial sustainability is important and that the voluntary action of people coming together to do volunteer work or to donate or to um you know the net that nonprofits lead in a really really significant way so no way do i want to denigrate their role but in order to you know i'm coming from a for-profit background which is you know, for some people that feels very dirty like a, oh like it's not altruistic it's like people are coming at it from greed and what I want to like highlight there is like my my perspective or an alternate narrative on how to think about that is today the way we we direct human time effort as a society is through the allocation of capital and it's monetized in in dollars and currency, the way that uh, na nature and ecosystems, the way they direct effort and energy and otherwise is by through the exchange of nutrients, largely carbon and other things. And right now we've got one system just humming along, just cranking. And it's not connected. It's not connected to ecosystems. It's fully extractive. And so, to the extent that we can connect those two, and you know, economists call this ecosystem services. Other people have very like strongly highlighted it's the system that underwrites all of humanity's existence, and said it's a little bit more than a techno wonky phrase. But if we can connect ecosystem services and we can connect uh, the human capital systems, all of a sudden that actually does put us in much more harmony. So. Where I see us headed is if we can, if we uh, as we start to create negative incentives through uh, carbon offsets, or we start to start to create positive incentives, aka we've removed a lot of carbon, so we reward that activity. We can collectivize action that way, and that system exists today, and that's what offsets do. And I think like to some of the the questions like, hey, how do we trust it? We've already gone through several iterations of the system. The Kyoto Protocol um, was the first version. California's uh, market then learned from that version and created a price floor on the market so that it couldn't just drop to nothing. Um, Washington's market has now learned from that. Uh, Canada, you know, I'm very speaking very U.S. and uh, North American centric here. But that's where you know my knowledge base is. Canada just won a court battle, and now they've got a federal market. So the all each market is learning from a subsequent iterations, and we're building a better system. And so um, those third party players, we're you know one of one of the systems now. One of the problems now is, well, there's not enough removal offsets in the system, or they're too you know they might become too expensive. Well, we are now bringing that next version, which is we can forecast with a degree of confidence what trees will remove over the next hundred years. That creates the, the supply of the offsets. And that also makes the system viable for those who, who come next. And so I would describe us as, you know, for those who love baseball as like an opening pitcher. We'll, you know, we're, the trees are the technology that is available. We'll get it going. We build the supply, but there are other, other systems that are going to come in and it's a yes and all of the above approach. We need other systems like direct air carbon capture, like weathering, like kelp otherwise to help like sort of be the closing pitcher um, and sort of bring in additional uh, removal. So, you know, I, 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 we're building a system and I think that's really important. Thank you. Well, I'm gonna. Um, it's it's uh, two forty four here in the uh, in the West Coast, uh, just time zone. So uh, we're we're going to transition to questions, and I want to really thank 
uh, Grant and Andrew very much um, for the opportunity to to um, get to know well you, you know, get to know you Andrew for for many many years in, in Grant for the first time but uh, really appreciate and resonate deeply with both of uh, your life journey and sustainability um, work and uh, thank you very much. All Who right. do I turn this over to? Yeah, that Sorry? would be me. I'm here. I'm ready. Um, so uh, the first question comes from Oliver Dominic. Oliver, are you here and ready to unmute yourself? He says, especially on the corporate scale. Is he there? Yeah. Okay, go for it. So you were doing great. Um, but yeah, the basic question is whether the whether there's a sort of a psychological downside in a small piece of the carbon offset program, which involves you buy the offset, you feel good about it, and you decide you don't need to do anything more. Grant, did you have thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, I think uh, I, I think the the personal side of offsets is is probably less what will build the large scale of the market than what will be the systemic, meaning that right now, the reason that the EU market is so large is that it's a compliance market, it's mandated, it's required. Um, and if we think about the customer personas in the corporate space that are doing voluntary, I mean, I think that one of the things that helps give people a lot of trust and like, why would I, why would they do that? Why would they impose that cost? It's like we could go through a couple, a couple of quick customer personas. I'll do a, a sort of speed run here. If you're if you're tech and you're building a futurist brand, any future that doesn't think about or incorporate climate change is not a real future. It's a fiction. And so you've got to think about that and include it. That's one customer persona. It's part of your brand. It's how you do recruitment. Um, the other is direct, uh, like point of sale your Stripe, Shopify, Square, um, your MasterCard Visa, it's a feature in your product. If you can, if you can get cust if you can sell to a coffee shop or otherwise and say, we can offset, you know, that, that, you know, transaction, if the customer so chooses, all of a sudden you have a feature and that's why you distinguish yourself from somebody else who doesn't have that feature. Um, maritime shipping, container shipping, airlines, it's an old regulatory strategy. Please don't regulate us. We'll regulate ourselves. We'll buy the offsets, sort of like Motion Picture Association of America with PG and R ratings. Like those are voluntary, but everybody complies with them because otherwise the government's going to get in there. And that is not what Hollywood wants. Um, and then you've got uh, reinsurance. They're underwriting the insurance policies that uh, in large part are like hold Florida real estate, hold other areas of the, of the globe that are going to be affected by climate, whether it's fire, floods, um, tornadoes, otherwise. And they don't have they don't have carbon priced. And if your whole job is to price risk and you have not thought about climate change, like they there there's an awareness there. So you see like Swiss Re, Munich, Munich Re, otherwise others starting to like start to put pressure on like we need to start pricing this in. There needs to be a market, and that's how we get our signal. And then you've got real estate developers thinking about like. Uh, Cal there's some California areas that require that if you build homes over a certain quantity, you have to not only offset just the emissions from the construction, um, as Andrew's been describing, but also the next hundred years of occupancy, um, which Andrew's also been speaking to, um, which is, uh, you know, that's your scope one, two, and three emissions. And all of a sudden, you don't have enough supply. Those homes get real expensive. Well, that gets into other issues such as affordability of housing and, and otherwise. So those are kind of the customer personas that we're seeing emerge. Um, and I think that's really where we start to see, you know, some of those are voluntary and then some of those would be likely compliance in the sense of like, if you're an oil refinery, if you're, you're aviation or otherwise, like, how do you, how do you navigate those? Great. Thanks. All right. Next question. There's so many questions. It's hard to pick. Um, I think, let's see, there was one from... Evan, I think that was um, about the difference between mature and young forests and carbon removal. Ev, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, I was just um, thinking about a, a piece I wrote where I, I had only been able to just barely touch on that. I was about actually about the subject um, for SNS, and 
it it struck me that um, the life cycle of a forest, you know, when we've planted, replanted forest, Grant, this is like right up your alley. Um, early on, it it clearly, I think I got a number from the state of Vermont or something, but early, you, you can tell us, I'm sure, that early on, it's it's really not nearly as effective as a mature forest. So I'm just wondering um, what the difference is, you know, what are the real numbers there? And what does that mean for how long we need to, to let these forests live before we harvest them or whatever it's going to be um, to maximize the effect? I have the worst answer for a Q&A, which is it depends. Um, and so, um, but let me like give you some nuance on that and then we can speak there, which is like, like what we love about Climate Action Reserve and their protocol is it's not a, you know, it's not just a, a, a all like sort of lumping all trees together it, and it's not lumping all geographies together because they're very different. Um, so temperate conifers break it down by species. So is it hemlock? Is it fir? Is it spruce? I mean, I'm, I'm going um, with, you know, things that most people would recognize from a Christmas tree parking lot, right? Is um, there, there's, uh, there's different growth rates that have evolved for different reasons. And so how much carbon is going to be captured over time depends on the species. And then it depends on where it's at. Um, if you look at CARS methodology, if you're doing reforestation with temperate conifer species in California, you're going to generate less tons of sequestration or, or removal over the next hundred years than if you're in Western Washington or Western Oregon. And it's just because Western Washington, Oregon as a general sort of have more water, trees can grow, you know, trees like water, shockingly. And so they grow faster, taller and remove more carbon. So that's, I mean, that's really sort of breaking it down by species, by, by geography and, and putting it in layperson terms there. But that's, uh, and then what, what happens over that time period is the trees do have growth curves and those are backed up by the scientific weight papers. And that's really Carr's job to create that transparency and trust is not like, oh, trust drone seed. They, you know, they, they mapped out how, you know, Doug Fur in Western Washington, in fact, they did it for the entire US. It's much more of like, no, trust Carr because they mapped that out and they made it super conservative because the goal is under promise and over deliver. And then, you know, similar to US Green Building Council and, and uh, other sort of uh, the building emissions, um, then that uh, there is a, they, they utilize accredited professionals that come out and verify that the trees are alive a year after, so that you know, can make sure that there's that accountability in the project. Can I just um, add Oliver's little follow on there? Do you, can you just tell us really quickly what plants sequester the most carbon? Oh, um, I don't have a great answer for that, but I mean, we work with, um, we work with early cereal species. So that can include some of the first things that would, uh, that would pop up as far as your, um, um, and then we also work with, work with sort of later secessional species. So that would be like your Doug fir and otherwise, and how that compares to every species in Carr's portfolio, I couldn't say, um, but I know what we work with, uh, unfortunately. And, uh, and, and largely the biggest determinant there is, is geography um, because of, soil because of water. And so that should give people trust, not, you know, what I would hate is for people to be like, oh, it sounds really hard. I would, you know, no, it's much more like trust, trust that there's somebody who's checked it very similar to like, you trust that the, like, you know, for a motion picture association of America, like maybe your four-year-old doesn't need to see a PG-13 movie. Like, you know, like you would just kind of trust that. Um, uh, but, but yeah. Okay, I want, I want to jump in because I want to make sure we get at least one more question in. Um, Robert McClure has a question for Andrew. Robert, are you there? Hey, hi, Andrew. Um, I'm interested in what the state policies that have been adopted so far to drive down embodied carbon look like. You mentioned that there were nine states. I'd be interested to know right. what are they requiring or incentivizing and what are the states or what's, what states doing the best job? Right. So it's all starting actually with procurement for infrastructure. So it, uh, the kind of opening salvo in this, um, in this campaign was California three years ago with what they called the Buy Clean California Act. And it was an act that required all state procurement dollars to, that, that are spent on infrastructure development or construction to, be, uh, to take into account the carbon footprint of building materials. And um, and that was the first attempt to do that in the in the wake. It wasn't the best one actually, uh, because in that very first California initiative, uh, they they uh, the cement industry did a bunch of lobbying and they left cement out of the picture, for example. But uh, 
not surprisingly, I, I suppose, but that was a great lesson for other people in other states to learn about how to focus on the, on the solution. Here in Washington state, uh, where I live, um, two years ago, the Carbon Leadership Forum was funded by the state legislature to develop a, a, a study focused on the what what are the most effective low carbon uh, policies uh, for building and building materials that could be uh, used to de de to design a buy clean Washington um, 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 uh, act and that was being presented in the state legislature and we did that work in this the past three legislative sessions uh, in Washington state now uh, that has been proposed and has not yet been passed. But in places like Colorado and New York and Minnesota um, and several others, um, there, there actually have been buy clean state policies passed that drive state level procurement of building materials. And, um, and the, there are other organizations like the, uh, the Port Authority of New York, New Jersey, for example, they've got like three construction projects under underway right now in development right now that will be multi multi billion dollar projects, including a new Lincoln Tunnel and a new a new Port Authority and, and so on. And they're doing a low carbon um, um, procurement in all of those cases and doing it in alliance with and partnership with with our with our team. Um, so you can go to uh, if you go to the carbon leadership forum.org website um, and select uh, policies from the toolkit menu, you'll see um, a map that shows all of the policies across the, the uh, across the world, especially in North America and Europe, because that's where the real action is so far. And they're at all levels from um, from city level building codes to state level procurement policies to, to federal guidelines uh, that govern the spending of tax dollars for infrastructure. That's amazing. Um, Andrew, maybe you could drop that in the chat related to this session. Um, yeah. And if you do it outside of after the session ends, people will be able to find it after the session. So there's a little chat box um, back on the platform, not in Zoom. That's actually okay. better in some ways. I'll, I'll do both. OK, awesome. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you, Grant. Thank you. And Cynthia, thank you so much for giving us your time and energy. We really appreciate it. You guys are doing amazing work. Um, please let us know how we can continue to support you on this long and uh, strenuous journey of entrepreneurship. Um, I know it is a hard one and we really appreciate you being here. Thanks to you all for the great questions. <laughs> yeah. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.